Hi everybody. Today we are going to talk about autism and subtyping autism. I know anybody who's really interested in this topic is horrified uh, by the increase in autism that has happened over the last three decades. So um, when I was in uh, my residency program, we were talking about autism that was about one in 10,000 uh, people. And now, depending on the numbers you believe, it's one in 45, one in 55, a new one, one in 36. And that's just horrifying for any family. And when you have uh, a child with autism, you, it's, it's chronically stressful because you're worried not only for what's happening that day, but you're worried about what's going to happen in, in the future. Here at Amen Clinics, we published a study last year on about a thousand autistic kids. So we've been studying autism for a very long time. And what we discovered with our imaging work, it's just not one thing. Um, the classic pattern is they are hyperfrontal. What does that mean? Their frontal lobes are hyperactive, hyperfrontal. Um, and they have smaller and usually underactive cerebellums in the back bottom part of the brain. And so when you're hyperfrontal, people tend to have trouble shifting their attention. So they worry, they can hold on to things. If things don't go a certain way, they can be really upset. Uh, and so if I just step back a little bit and go, what are the hallmark features of autism? It's they have speech delay, social skills problems, and they get stuck on things. It often looks like they also have OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. So speech problems, get stuck on things, and have social skills issues. Now, not all people with autism have everything. Um, until recently, we had this diagnostic category called Asperger's syndrome, where their speech pretty much was fine, but they still had social skills issues and had trouble getting stuck on things. I, I don't like the American Psychiatric Association with DSM-5 just sort of lumped everybody together. I'm not a fan of that because, I mean, you can have somebody who's severely mentally retarded with autism and someone who's the CEO of a tech company with, it's like, no, it's more complicated than, than that. Anyways, those hallmark features, so the hyperfrontality, frontal lobes being hyperactive, that goes with the cognitive rigidity, the inflexibility, worrying, getting the same thought in your head over and over again, the obsessions that many autistic kids have. The low activity in the cerebellum, the cerebellum is so important, more important than uh, most scientists give it credit for. I call it the Rodney Dangerfield part of the brain, you know, it just gets no respect. Um, although I said that to somebody recently and they had no idea what I was talking about and I realized they were like 24 and um, it just made me feel old. So I'm gonna have to come up with a younger uh, version of I get no respect. But the cerebellum has half of the brain's neurons. 50% of the brain's neurons are in this, cerebellum means little brain, the back bottom part of your brain and it's involved in processing speed, coordination, but also thought coordination, your ability to quickly integrate new information. So if that's smaller or underactive, which we saw in our study, then people are gonna have trouble shifting their attention because their thoughts are gonna be slower and they're gonna get confused and that's gonna make them angry and upset. So in practical terms, doing coordination exercises with kids who have autism are really helpful. So my favorite is table tennis uh, or dancing or even learning to catch a ball. Uh, really important. Um, but 
So, so that's the classic pattern for autism. Hyperfrontal, small cerebellum. And what we realized is everybody was not classic. Uh, that we see that pattern a lot, but we also see the ring of fire pattern where it's not just hyperfrontal, their brain is overactive in their temporal lobes, in their parietal lobes, the top back part of their brain. It's their brain's just working way too hard, often due to inflammation, either from an environmental toxin or some inflammatory process going on in their bodies. And there is a huge connection between gut problems, leaky gut, and autism, and people who have this thing we call leaky gut um, also have higher levels of inflammation in their body. Dr. Amy, can you, um, can you elaborate a little bit more on inflammation and what that looks like for individuals with autism? That's a common question. So inflammation, now we test for it with a lab test called C-reactive protein. Um, but a lot of my integrative medicine friends also, they test stool samples, they test the permeability of your gut. Now, if this is the first time you've heard this term leaky gut, um, your intestinal tract, so all 30, 35 feet of it, is lined with a single cell wall lining. So the lining that protects uh, your body from what you put in your mouth uh, is only a single cell thick. If the lining of the gut becomes damaged, uh, it actually will develop holes in it and things end up in your body that shouldn't be in your body. And that will trigger an inflammatory response. So the easiest way to think about inflammation is think about if somebody come, came and cut my hand so yes, it would bleed, but as it would heal, you'd notice it would be red, it would be hard, it would be painful, have pus coming out of it. Well, that same process, the inflammation um, that happens on the outside when you get hurt, it also ends up happening on the inside. So blood vessels become inflamed, other tissues become inflamed, and we know it's a major cause of Alzheimer's disease. It's a major cause of depression. It's a big cause of cancer and heart disease. And many people think it's also one of the significant causes of autism. On the topic of autism, have you ever seen kids with high functioning autism or Asperger's be able to stop taking medications? So um, I've seen many kids with high functioning Asperger's or autism stop taking their medications. And I actually don't think of medication as the first line treatment for autism. I think trying to address what are the causes, you know, is it your gut? Is it nutritional deficiencies? Is it because you have a toxin? Um, and so, so we see this classic pattern. We also see this inflammatory pattern we call the ring of fire. But there's another one and it's a toxic pattern where it looks like the brain has had a toxic insult, either from lack of oxygen uh, at birth or um, mold exposure, heavy metal exposure, um, or even perhaps an infectious uh, cause like Lyme or herpes or another sort of uh, bacteria or virus that attacks the brain. So, so the point is, if you never look at the brain of an autistic child, you just diagnose them based on symptoms, you, you don't have a map on how to try to understand this is my child or my adult brain, this is what my brain actually looks like, so that you can begin to um, treat it, you can begin to heal it, targeting the treatment to the individual's brain, not you have autism. There's no pill for autism because it's not one thing. And here at Amon Clinics, we're not opposed to medication. We use it when it's appropriate, but we're opposed to the indiscriminate use of medication without a map 
and the spec scans we do here give us a map to help us understand what we're um, trying to, to do. Now, when it comes to inflammation, one of my first strategies is to put um, all of my patients on an elimination diet. What does that mean? It mean you eliminate the bad things and you feed them good things. And so I try to get rid of wheat, uh, dairy, corn, and soy processed foods. Now I know some of you are going, well, what is there to eat? 10,000 things, I mean, literally. Uh, but the brain hates change, and if you've been feeding a child who's rigid, uh, macaroni and cheese and pizza all the time, then change is hard. Uh, but you, you can do it. In fact, our cookbook, uh, The Brain Warrior's Way, which is gorgeous and has 135 recipes, Every single recipe is gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, corn-free, and there's obviously no preservatives in it. Uh, I have another, not me, my wife wrote a book uh, called Healing ADD Through Food. And all, again, all of the recipes, gluten-free, corn-free, soy-free, dairy-free. Um, it's just a different way to think about food, but quite frankly, Gluten's not really great for anybody. I mean, not everybody needs to avoid it, but there's about 7% of the population that responds in a very negative way to it. Um, dairy, you know, I think the beans that need dairy are baby cows. Uh, with all the antibiotics and hormones uh, and sensitivity to dairy in this country, it's just not essential. You know, I had this, my wife actually made it for me this morning, this uh, almond milk uh, uh, pumpkin spice cappuccino. It's like amazing. And there's like no dairy in it. And you can do this. Uh, it's not hard. It's just getting your mind wrapped around it. First time I tried this on a patient 25 years ago, uh, the child got 100 new words within a month. I mean, it was so cool. Um, and many of the really sensitive kids uh, often have uh, dairy uh, or wheat issues. Dr. Amen, is it proven um, that the gut can be fully healed through diet? The gut can be fully healed. Um, some people need more than diet. So for example, if they have yeast overgrowth, uh, they may need medicine. For that. Many people also need probiotics to help repopulate good uh, bacteria in the gut. And the last question, um, what are your thoughts on neurofeedback to calm the ring of fire in the brain? So I'm a huge fan of neurofeedback. I have been for many years. When I see ring of fire, the first thing I want to do is try an elimination diet to make sure it's not some sort of inflammatory issue. Um, I also like all of my kids to take a multiple vitamin, omega-3 fatty acids, optimize their vitamin D level. Um, and I think neurofeedback is just one of the really good treatments. I'm also a huge fan of hyperbaric oxygen therapy for my autistic population, especially if we see low overall activity on the scans, it tends to help them think better, sleep better, uh, be more cooperative. In my new public television special, uh, Memory Rescue, I actually close the show with the story of Grace, who um, was born with a mitochondrial uh, disorder. And I mean, they basically were gonna take her off life support so she could die when she was three and the mother um, advocated for her in the strongest way possible, actually drove her to another state, put her in a hyperbaric chamber, and over time she just got dramatically better. I mean, it's a very special story. So that's an option. Um, I have a granddaughter that's been um, labeled as autistic. She actually has a specific genetic micro deletion um, 
and I do all these things for her. Uh, there is so much hope. I think that's the biggest thing our brain imaging work has shown us, is that you're not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better. You just have to have a smart, targeted approach. Thanks so much.